Welcome to Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. This program is sponsored by some area churches of Christ and is dedicated to spreading the everlasting gospel as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The churches of Christ accept the Scriptures as totally inspired of God and the all-sufficient guide for faith and practice. Therefore, they reject all doctrines of men and rely totally on the Bible to direct their course in serving God. It is our pledge to you that each lesson will be the truth as revealed in His Holy Word. Mr. Barnett carefully prepares the graphic so you can clearly see the book, chapter, and verse of each lesson taught. We urge you to either copy the scriptures used or record this program for further study. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need prayer, the Seeking the Lost ministry can be reached toll-free at 1-800-390-7734. It is our prayer that Seeking the Lost will be an important source of information about God's Word and will help you more perfectly worship Him. And now, here is Mr. Barnett. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to the Seek and the Lost broadcast. Today I want to talk to you about a subject that you probably have heard a lot about, maybe even recently, but it's a subject that we refer to as Armageddon. Do you know that in the scriptures there's only one time that the name Armageddon is used? It's found in Revelation 16 and 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, and that really is pronounced Armageddon. Uh, this has uh, somewhat of a history. Armageddon was a hill or a city of Megiddo. As I understand it, the hill became apparent because when, it's, when the city was destroyed, which it was many times, they'd come in and build right on top of it. But the plain around it, around Megiddo, is where all the action took place. It was famous for two great victories of Barak over the Canaanites and Gideon over the Midianites. And so we think about it as something that is personal to the Jewish people. It was also famous for two great disasters, the deaths of Saul and Josiah. Hence in Revelation, when you mention the word Armageddon, it's used <clears throat> to signify a place of both tragedy and triumph. Armageddon. So what does the scripture say about it? But what is Armageddon? <clears throat> Many times today, after a great earthquake or some other kind of natural uh, catastrophe, people talk about Armageddon. When wars break out all over the face of the earth, people talk about Armageddon. But what are we talking about? Megiddo, in the first century, to the first century believer, would bring to mind great catastrophic events as Pearl Harbor and 9-11 would to the American people. In other words, when you would say something, well, there's just going to be another 9-11, or there's going to be another Pearl Harbor, to all of us that brings up these vivid memories of a great catastrophe, and this is the way it was with the Jewish people when they talked about Armageddon. The Holy Ghost was using the ghetto, that is Armageddon, correctly spelled Armageddon, to convey to the persecuted Christians the final victory over Satan and imperial Rome was going to happen. Remember that the people are in horrific persecution at this time. But anyway, God says it's going to change. The false teaching about Armageddon has pledged every last generation. I found this quotation from the famous commentary, uh, commentator Adam Clark. He lived from 1762 to 1832, one of the most brilliant of all of the biblical scholars of yesteryear. And listen to what he says. How ridiculous have been the conjectures of men relative to this point, that is Armageddon. Within the last 20 years, this battle has been fought at various places, according to the pure blind seers and self-inspired prophets. At one time, it was Austerlich. This is during the Napoleonic Wars. And another, Moscow, another, Leipzig, and now Waterloo. We've heard of that. And thus they have gone on and will continue to go on confounding and being confounded. In other words, even in his day, 
as it is today, that something comes up extraordinary out of the order, and people talk about, oh, this is going to lead to Armageddon. This is going to lead to Armageddon. We're going to study that. I want you to study carefully with me. The speculations of man continue even in our modern day. Of course, Pearl Harbor has looked upon as being the beginning of Armageddon. World War I and II, same thing. The Afghanistan War and the Iraqi War, 9-11, and now the ISIS threat. All of these are looked upon as the beginning of Armageddon. And you'll hear people make comments about that. We're going to study this carefully. I want you to ask yourself, what is meant by shortly? Now, you, you believe that I'm going to tell you the truth. And I am absolutely going to show you something that nobody shows you about the book of Revelation. They use it as a happy revelation, as a happy hunting ground for every kind of theory and idea that they want to bring up. No matter how foreign to the scriptures you find it, they, they say, well, it's in, in Revelation. But I want you to look at the word shortly. Somebody said, well, of course I know what shortly means. Well, look at this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the first verse of the first chapter of the book of Revelation, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must, what is that word right there? must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's the one that owns it. He sent it to John. But here I want you to notice, it must shortly come to pass. What did he mean by that? We find that the great scholars of the age, those who have written these lexicons, and one of the most prominent is Ardenk and Gingrich. And they define shortly as quick, at once, without delay, or soon, in a short time. And I've given you the references there. That's what shortly means. I'm giving you the key to understand the book of Revelation if you will watch it. Parallel uses of the same word, shortly. First of all, 1 Corinthians 4 and 19. Paul wrote to Corinthians and says, but I will come to you shortly. Did he mean that he was going to come to them some 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years later? No, shortly. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea. In other words, Paul is on trial for his life. And he's going to get before Festus. And they say, you want us to send Festus up there where you are? He says, no, he said, you keep him in Caesarea, that he himself was going to be there shortly. Well, now, what did shortly mean? Did it mean 500, 600, even 1,000, 2,000 years? Festus arrived in Caesarea 10 days later. It was shortly. Again, <clears throat> Philippians 2. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall, be, shall come shortly. Well, Paul, you're going to delay that 50 years or 100 or 1,000? Of course not. It means shortly. 1 Timothy 3, these things I write unto you, though I hope to come to you shortly. You all understand what I'm saying? I'm showing you examples of how shortly is used in other passages of the Scripture. Look at this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Does that mean a millennium, a thousand years, or two thousand, or maybe even three thousand away? He says it must shortly come to pass. Where is that found? It's found in the very first verse of the very first chapter of the book of Revelation. And it tells you the key to Revelation that what I'm writing about is going to happen soon. Look at this, Revelation 22 and 6. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must what? Shortly take place. Now then, modern day preachers need to look at that and look at it very carefully. He said it must shortly take place. 
the book of Revelation. Some say that it was written around 96 AD. Others think it was written even before the fall of Jerusalem, saying that the book never mentioned that catastrophic event. Personally, I don't know, but I rely upon the scholars. I know it was written during the first century. I can put it down there. And he said, you know, shortly, and you know, just cornbread thinking on this, you're going to understand. All of those passages that I had before time, showing how shortly is used in the Bible, and so we used here too. So, you know, we're not blind. Today's headlines cannot be read in the book of Revelation. But yet we find that many people try to do that. They try to impress their flock. Oh, did you see the headlines? That means that the time is very close. They don't know that. Have no idea whatsoever. And they have misread the scriptures. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Don't grab up today's modern newspapers and expect to find the fulfillment of Revelation in there. The time is at hand. What does the time at hand mean? Well, according to the great lexicographers, it means that the time is close, that it's near, that it's nearby, it's soon to come to pass. And yet people grab up the book of Revelation and they look at a big earthquake or some other catastrophe. Oh, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of Armageddon. You know, you just got to use common sense sometimes. Today's headlines cannot be found in Revelation 22. Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. What does that mean? That means... You know, there's no use waiting that for the fulfillment of what I've just told you, because it's coming. The time is at hand. What does that mean, according to the lexicographers? Close, near, nearby, soon to come to pass. For the time is at hand. You see, people make a happy hunting ground of any kind of error that they want to espouse, Find it in the book of Revelation, and, you know, people don't know much about that. Think about this. Question. If at hand means close, near, nearby, or soon to come to pass in these passages, why is it different in Revelation? Revelation 1 and also in chapter 22. What are you talking about right here? Now look at that hand. R rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Who is the betrayer? Well, Judas is Iscariot. Let's get out of here. My betrayer, he's close by. Yeah, but in the book of Revelation, that don't mean anything. Are you sure? Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Did that mean that the Passover at hand, that it was 2,000 years away? That's what a lot of people won't interpret revelation for you to mean just exactly that. But it means at hand, it's close by. Look at this, Mark 1 and 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's close by. I know that many of you hear the story that I hope that someday to live to see the kingdom of God on earth. My friends. The kingdom of God was at hand at the time this was written, and it came into existence as recorded in the second chapter of the book of Acts when the church and the kingdom was established because they're one and the same thing. It's important to understand that. And so if at hand means close or nearby in these passages, why can't it mean the same thing in Revelation? Revelation 22, he which testifies these things says, surely I come quickly, soon. Even so come Lord Jesus. And this, of course, in Strong's numbers, it means quickly here, means speedily, without delay. First century Christians needed encouragement to hang on to and to remain steadfast in the past of the inhuman mistreatment by the... Jews and the Roman Empire. 
they were really hurting at that time. So let's go on and think about this. Revelation was written to the first century Christians who were suffering great persecution at the hand of the Jews and the Roman Empire. Did you know something? Those first century Christians, they understood. They understood Revelation perfectly. They understood the symbols. They understood what was being said there. And of course, we have to, if we're going to understand Revelation, we've got to put it on the background of those people that lived during that time. Revelation was to confirm what would soon come to pass and not to fulfill the news headlines of the 21st century. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel and to his servants. One thing we have to realize that the book of Revelation is written with symbols. Signified it. Signified it, if you'd say in cornbread language. It is, a, it is symbolized. And they, they understood it perfectly. We have to struggle. What, are, what about those restoration prophecies? No, a lot of people bring it up. Oh, he said he's going to carry Israel back. Well, the fact is, he did. Here's a prophecy in Jeremiah 30. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave to their forefathers to possess, to possess says the Lord. He said he's going to bring them back. And you know when the new state of Israel was formed after World War II? Oh, that's the beginning. That is the fulfillment of that prophecy that he's going to bring us. No, it's not. This prophecy had already been fulfilled long before these things happened. They were fulfilled by the proclamation of the, of the Persian king Cyrus, the conqueror of Babylon, because he allowed the people to go back. Actually, there were three expeditions of the people of Israel back to their homeland. They were led by Zerubbabel, by Ezra, and Nehemiah. The people of Israel began their return from captivity, 536 B.C. That, those old restoration prophecies of the, of the Old Testament have already been fulfilled. Now, <clears throat> let's think about this. Many religionists insist that the world history will culminate in a cataclysmic global holocaust known as Armageddon, followed by the millennium, a so-called thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. And that's not going to happen. And I'll, I'll prove it to you if you, will, if you will study with me. They contend that the current events in the mid, uh, Middle East, Russia, and China are arranging themselves in such a fashion that the second coming of Christ is imminent. Even though Jesus said, there'd be no signs, I'm coming back as a thief in the night. Let's think about it. The question's for you. Did Jesus want the first readers of the book of Revelation to believe that Armageddon was a future physical battle fought with real weapons between himself and Satan taking place at or near Megiddo hundreds of years later? Or did they understand their persecution by the evil Roman Empire would soon end in ultimate victory? Well, they needed help then. They weren't thinking about two thousand three thousand years ahead the idea of a worldwide class of nations and a final battle must be rejected why blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near you know i believe the holy spirit on this don't you the reason that we ex we have to reject this idea of a battle that's coming, it ignores the time indicators of the book of Revelation. And this is one of them. The time is near. Here's another. It, it testi testifies those that surely I am coming quickly. It's completely ignored by those who teach this doctrine of Armageddon that is to happen in the future. The idea 
of a worldwide clash of nations and a final must be rejected because it ignores the time indicators of the book of Revelation must shortly come to pass and the things which must shortly be done. You see that? I come quickly. It's shortly come to pass. The things must be done quickly. Don't you see? You have to reject any doctrine that doesn't fit that. The idea of a worldwide class of nations and a final uh, battle must be rejected because it ignores the symbolic nature of the prophecies in Revelation. They read them literally. Look at this. Forcing Revelation 16, 16 to mean a literal military campaign makes no more sense than arguing Mary was literally threatened by a great red dragon at the birth of Jesus. And you'll read that in Revelation 12, that it talks about that. It talks about, uh, you know, the fact that they had to flee for their lives, Joseph and Mary, and for the life of the child. And so did that literally happen? Did this great dragon threaten? They understood what it was talking about. It was understood to be talking about Herod and the powers that be. The idea that this clash of nations is coming must be rejected. It changes Jesus' kingdom into the very thing he denied. Oh, Jesus is coming back and he's going to establish this great kingdom here on earth. He is not. He said it himself, my kingdom is not, is not of this world. It's not going to happen. He has a kingdom. It's in the world today, but it's not an earthly kingdom like a king sitting on a literal throne or a president reigning or administrating the Constitution. It's not that. It is a spiritual kingdom. Think about this. Jesus will never reign on a literal throne in Jerusalem or Judah or anywhere else. It won't happen. Why do I know that? Jeremiah 22. O oh, earth, earth, earth. This is a prophet speaking to the world. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God. Write ye this man childless, talking about Jeconiah, the last king of, is, of Judah before they were carried away into Babylonian captivity. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. His dynasty is over. It won't ever happen again. And you know what? The scriptures tell us in Matthew 1 and 11 that Jeconiah is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. You find it right there in Matthew 1 11. And so it's just simply reasoning, common sense, that item number one, Jeremiah wrote that none of Jeconiah's or Coniah's descendants could ever reign in Judea. Oh, yeah, he's coming back to reign. No, he's not. He, he cannot unless he wants to violate these scriptures. Jesus is a descendant of Jeconiah. And therefore, the conclusion Jesus can never sit on David's throne and literally reign in Jerusalem. Just not going to happen. Let's go on. <clears throat> Jesus is reigning and ruling now, right now, on the spiritual throne of David. You remember what was said in Acts 2. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They knew that was coming, but the prophecies made to David. Colossians 1 and 13. Another proof that the kingdom was in existence then. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. God would not ask us to believe that he would put them into a kingdom that didn't even exist. Translated us into the kingdom. We must not make a fool out of the Almighty. I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation. What else, John? And in the kingdom, in the kingdom, writing to the church, seven churches of Asia, he said he was their brother in tribulation, their brother and companion in the kingdom. And he wrote to the seven churches of Asia. So easy to understand, isn't it? 
Those preaching Armageddon mania seem to ignore the fact that the book was written to an original, immediate audience. The seven churches of Asia situated in Asia Minor suffering horrific persecution. And there is a proof of it. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Armageddon. The Christians in the seven churches of Asia were certainly in no need of assurance that some future global holocaust would occur some 2,000 or 3,000 years away from their present suffering. These Christians were in desperate need of assurance that Christ would come to their aid absolutely and do it soon. See what I'm talking about? Let's look again. Will there be, there will not be a literal battle of Armageddon. It's not going to happen. In the first century, two umpires went forth to capture the hearts and the minds of people and of men and women, boys and girls. And those were the Roman Empire and the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom is now. It is waging war against Satan now. If you're waiting for Armageddon and for the kingdom to be established then to get to work, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. Think about this. It was not, it is, was not fought with real weapons, but with moral, spiritual, intellectual weapons wielded by the minds and the hearts of men and women all over the world. Onward Christian soldiers. You know this. Look at first, uh, 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Well, how do you war? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought unto captivity to the obedience of Christ. Our weapons are not carnal. What does that mean? They're not world today. It's not a sword or a gun or a pistol or an airplane or a tank. Our weapons are the everlasting gospel of Christ. It are, they are spiritual weapons. And the battle between good and evil is continuing now, even after the defeat of the evil imperial Roman Empire. There's still a lot of evil in the world, and the only way to combat that is to use the scriptures, the sword of the Spirit. Something to think about, isn't it? The battle between this is, is raging now. Fight the good fight of faith, he says. Then after what Paul said, I fought a good fight. Let's all strive to fight the good fight and to finish our lives saying, did the best we could. Thanks for watching. This is Earl Barnes. You have a good day. You have been watching Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. If you need prayer or have comments or questions, feel free to call the Seeking the Lost Ministry at 1-800-390-7734. That's toll free, 1-800-390-7734.